Stewart's Conversations podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations Podcast. Today I'm very lucky to have Dr. Miranda Lai with me and um, Dr. Miranda Lai is a senior lecturer at RMIT University. Um, she's published uh, widely in public service interpreting and its training. Um, uh, in addition to many of her articles and books, she's also done research and published about vicarious trauma as well. Uh, Dr. Miranda, welcome today and thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Fati, how are you? Thank you for joining um, I'm good, thank you, and thanks again for taking the time. Um, now, you've, you've conducted some research on vicarious trauma, and uh, you also, uh, I know that, teach uh, some lectures about vicarious trauma at RMIT University as well. Um, so I'm thinking that you are the person to go to in regards to vicarious trauma for interpreters and translators. Um, first of all, can you please uh, tell us what is vicarious trauma and why is it something that uh, us interpreters and translators need to be aware of? Thank you for the question. Normally when I talk about vicarious trauma, I kind of divide um, the explanation, if you like, into two parts, of course, you know, you have these two words and I go to trauma first. If you look at trauma, normally we can relate to physical trauma and sometimes psychological trauma, okay? Or, or um, uh, trauma that you, it's not physical, okay? Now, moving on to vicarious, the word actually means that you don't personally experience something. You don't do it yourself. Rather, you experience something by watching it or by listening to or by reading about something. So in other words, if you took put the two words together, vicarious trauma, it is something that you yourself, um, you don't experience the traumatic event per se, rather you hear something relaying um, their trauma stories or you um, help someone who um, has been through trauma or the person who experienced a, you know, catastrophic event and then you are somehow involved in helping the person um, or uh, listening to the person or providing help. So basically that's what uh, vicarious trauma is. So is it enough for me to witness something horrifying or hear about something horrifying once, for example, you know, if I, if I see an accident on the street or if I hear a, you know, a traumatic story once, is that going to be enough for me to be traumatised vicariously? Um, yes and no. You can say that you are vicariously traumatised temporarily. Yeah, but then if you look at the definition of vicarious trauma clinically, no, it is not. Um, I always give people this ex example by asking, um, uh, I know you are a film buff, Ati. Have you ever watched The Exorcist? Just very recently I did actually for Halloween and uh, it, uh, you know, it, it's been around for a few years that film, but um, it definitely gave me the frights, I tell you that. Oh yes, oh yes. I remember when I first watched it as a teenager and of course that was last year. Um, I watched the movie and I was so horrified. I was so scared that I couldn't sleep for months. But then watching a horror film or witnessing a traumatic event once, it's not going to make you, you know, vicariously traumatized. I mean, at least from a clinical definition. Now, um, as opposed to that, for example, if a, an actor is continuously being asked to act in, you know, a whole series of trauma um, films or, you know, horror films, yes, the actor is actually prone to acquire vicarious trauma, if that makes sense. So in very much the same sense that say, you know, imagine a um, psychotherapist, day in, day out, what do they do? Well, being a help profession, they have to listen to their clients' um, traumatic events or their, um, you know, horrible stories in their life. And that's their job. But then if 
every single day you have this what we call continuous exposure and then you are yes indeed um, be prone you are prone to vicarious trauma and you do need to pay attention to it to guard against being affected by all the sad stories all the you know injustice unfair treatment to a fellow human being when we, when we teach our students, we always say, I think it's in the first lesson, we, we interpret in the first person. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has any effect on vicarious trauma because we're like owning all the emotions as we're interpreting in the first person? Exactly. Um, we always say that, you know, being a good interpreter, of course, you have to have your emotional investment in the story you are trying to relay for your client. And of course, like you say, yes, indeed, when we interpret, we always, I mean, apart from some exceptions, we always interpret in first person. Therefore, you do need to get into the psyche of mm -hmm. your client in order to, you know, relay the story it deserves. Therefore, um, in one of our studies, it does show that people feel that they are affected because they are so emotionally invested in the story. So yes, indeed. Although on the one hand, it is important for us to always remember to use first person to interpret, of course. On the other hand, we do need to be aware that, I mean, of course, it depends on the level of exposure. It's not as if you go out to interpret every day, every single day, you'd be interpreting something traumatic or very sad. It, Probably doesn't work that way for most of our colleagues in the field, but then you just need to be aware that if you continuously, you know, over a number of years, being exposed to um, higher, you know, levels of sad stories, you have to be aware that using first person, digesting your clients' sad stories, trying to convey it the way it should be conveyed, eventually it might have something, you know, um, permanent and then deep um, that that's changed within you and you need to be aware of it. What about translators? We've been talking about interpreters and um, how they uh, may be affected. Can translators be affected by vicarious trauma? Definitely. Um, a vicarious experience, it doesn't need to be kind of, you know, spoken. It doesn't need to be, you know, you hearing a trauma story. It can also be that you read about a sad story or a you know catastrophic event. So by the same token, um, a translator, for example, you might be translating, say, a coroner's report, or you might be translating a statement by a you know a refugee person who writes about um, their very sad past experience. And by that way, a translator is going to be uh, exposed to traumatic client content as well. And that's why for translators, as well as interpreters, interpreters is easier to kind of relate to this sort of thing. But translators, yes, indeed, to answer your, your question, will also come across um, materials that you need to be a bit mindful that um, they are, you know, going to impact your inner self. Now, from what I understand, it sounds like that um, vicarious trauma is something that sneaks up on you, mm. you know, because it's happening gradually over time. What are some of the signs that I should be looking out for as a practitioner? Mm -hmm. So I must have emphasize that, like we say, it's gradual, it's over time, and it also has to do with the level of exposure, yeah? So like we say, if you just go out, you know, every day you have a mixture of different interpreting assignments, then I think people need to be um, aware, but not to be overly alarmed that, oh, I'm going to get vicarious trauma. Now, coming back to your question about, uh, the signs of vicarious trauma, I think we can um, say divide them or we can look at it from a few different perspectives, if you like. So physiologically, you might feel fatigued or you might now find you have trouble falling asleep or you might be overeating, undereating or even develop headaches, rashes or ulcers, yeah? Emotionally, you might find that now, strangely, you feel very easily um, 
um, um, agitated. agitated. Yeah, you feel angry, you feel jumpiness, um, you feel sometimes really, really sad or anxious, etc. So emotionally, you will find, you know, something is changing within you. Behaviorally, um, you might find yourself, you know, socially withdrawal, withdrawing from your community, your family and your friends, mm. or you might find that hmm, you've You've, start, you've started to drink a bit more, or I know that, Fati, you have a motorbike and you love riding motorbike. And behaviorally, if you find yourself, you know, rather than your normal commuting using your motorbike, you go on a, you know, a speed ride more and more often, something's changed um, in terms of, of your behavior. Cognitively, um, you might start dreaming about your clients or you might dream about their stories, that's a sign, or um, you might have some persistent intrusive thoughts that's a kind of a more on the more serious end of the scale, or you might find yourself difficult to concentrate, to remember, or even making easy decisions in your daily life. You stand in front of a, you know, a counter trying to order your lunch and then all of a sudden you can't decide whether you are going to go for your chicken or your kebab, yeah? And lastly, in terms of your work, the signs are you know, various. You might feel, oh, these days I'm just lacking any motivation to work. So you might in, uh, decrease the amount of work amount of your work or you might overwork um, mm -hmm. you might see you know tardiness or you might see yourself being absent from work a lot more and lastly you might find that you have difficulty separating work from your personal life so all these you know physiologically emotionally behaviorally cognitively and in terms of your work you know, these are the signs we should be mindful of. Well, uh, from all these things that you told me, there have been times in my interpreting career that I have ticked, if not all of those boxes, most of those boxes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what, what are the impacts of it for an interpreter or a translator? Indeed. Um, if you think of all these um, signs that might impact you, we can divide them into um, impacts on your personal front. And then on the other hand, impacts on your professional front. Mm -hmm. Personally, it might affect your emotional and your physical well-being, goes without saying, and it might um, start changes in your relationships with your family, your loved ones, and your friends, and your community. Now, in terms of your professional work, it might affect your performance and your function, and most um, importantly, be mindful that it can also result in errors in your judgment, and that leads to your professional mistakes, which is very serious. So personally, and then professionally, we do have to be mindful that once, if you show signs of being affected by vicarious trauma, it does, you know, kind of sneak in in your personal life as well as your professional life. Uh, now, you've conducted some research on vicarious trauma, I think first in 2015, mm -hmm. and um, your second research uh, has started uh, in 2018, and I think it's still continuing now. Can you tell us a little bit about your research and what it aims to do? Hmm. The second one started um, a couple of years ago. It's concluded a lot, um, thankfully. So the first one back in 2015, yes, indeed, it was a um, qu qualitative, uh, quantitative one, if you like. In other words, we went out to survey a whole heap of interpreters. That was the largest, um, it still is the largest scale of survey ever conducted in Australia. Uh, 271 interpreters very, and translators very kindly participated in the survey telling us um, what 
their situation was. So that research, we were just trying to understand um, the level of exposure to trauma in term, in, amongst interpreters and translators and what they did about their exposure. So very quickly, if I could give you the research results. Sure. Um, nearly 80% of those interpreters and translators told us that they were affected by traumatic client material encountered in their work. And among those people, 70% of them reported that they had not sought any psychological assistance. I mean, it's not to say that there is anything wrong that you don't go for or you don't seek psycholo psychological assistance. It's, it just shows that you know most people, they don't go for professional help. Rather, these interpreters, they would talk, but who do they talk to? Mm. They talk to their colleagues. 55% of them talked from time to time. If they feel troubled, they talk to their colleagues. They would talk to their family members, 46%. And also they would talk to their friends, 38%. Of only a very small number of them, 14% of them would actually go to see a therapist. Um, so that goes to show that like, like uh, I've said, um, most people, they would talk, but then rather than going um, for professional help, they would talk to their colleagues, their family members or their friends. But if anything, the most alarming result from that uh, 2015 study is that 40% of these interpreters told us that, look, you know, I know about these uh, impacts of the sad stories that I come across and that I have to interpret for my clients. Therefore, in the future, I am not going to interpret in certain settings. Mm -hmm. 40% of them. I mean, for some languages where you have plenty of you know, qualified interpreters, this might not be a big issue. But then when it comes to smaller languages or languages that you don't really have a lot of qualified interpreters, 40%, you know, if people, 40% of the interpreters said that, look, you know, sorry, don't come to me in these settings, then it will be a big issue. So that's just something that we need to, as an industry, keep in mind the impacts of people's decision because they know that, you know, they would become um, mentally compromised. Therefore, they will refrain from working in certain settings. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as our 2015 um, survey. Very quickly, if we still have time, how are we- Please, please. Time? All right, so the second more recent study is like I say, it was conducted over the past couple of years and then a paper has just been published uh, this year, just very recently. So this time, rather than going for a, a whole heap of more than 2070 interpreters and then get some sort of overall picture, this time we go deeper, if you like. Mm. 47 interpreters very, very kindly came to our focus groups covering 50, 51 actually languages. And we asked them questions about um, their experience in feeling somehow um, kind of um, psychologically um, affected by the traumatic client content. We asked them how they view this experience. And we also asked them what they need because of this experience. Now, in terms of the psychological impacts that these 47 interpreters uh, experience, they say to us very interestingly that, you know, look, in my culture, they will say, um, showing your psychological vulnerability is very undesired. Therefore, I can't actually show it. Okay, um, if I say to people that, look, you know, I've interpreted quite a bit in, you know, certain settings and I feel, you know, I'm, I'm psychologically affected, people think that you are weak in your, in, you know, their culture. So it kind of results in people's hesitation to tell um, 
um, in interpreting assignments that look, you know, I don't think um, I want to take these kind of jobs for a while because they think that, you know, the, their community would view them as being weak. Um, that's one thing. And also people tell us that, look, you know, in my culture, um, trauma or um, losing a limb, that's trauma. But then if I say to people, look, you know, I uh, mentally, I want to guide against all these, you know, um, um, intrusive thoughts or I'm affected, people um, tend to kind of brush it off. Um, if you fall down, you hurt yourself, okay, people say, go to a doctor. But then if you say, look, you know, I'm psychologically disturbed because of all the stories I interpret, people kind of brush it off. Okay, so cultural views um, actually hamper these interpreters sharing of their vulnerability. That's one of the uh, things that we find in the research. In terms of the, the need um, that these interpreters told us, um, if I, we can divide them into three major aspects, if you like. One, they say to us, um, look, um, when we work with professionals, you know, your psychotherapists, your doctors, nurses, first responders, or, you know, counselors, we want to be regarded as a team member that they work with rather than using us. You know, we hear a lot of times that, you know, professionals say, oh, we, we have to use, we have to use an interpreter, but these interpreters told us that we reject that notion. Okay, we want them to treat us as part of the team and as part as a equal professional. That's the first. It, it's a collaboration, isn't it? It is a collaboration, yes. We need to be treated as part of them rather than the other. That's right. The second thing they told us is that very importantly, and I think that has a lot to do with what we why we are here. They say to us, look, um, of course, a lot of interpreting assignments come from interpreting agencies and interpreting agencies being our employer, we need to access, we need to be able to access employee assistance program or in short EAP, okay? Um, they tell us that we are scared that if we say to interpreting agency that, look, I'm psychologically affected, therefore I want to give it a break um, by not taking certain assignments, they are afraid that they will be labeled. And then the interpreting agencies would not engage them anymore. Yeah. Therefore, the message I suppose is really to let people know that, and I'm sure with uh, your organization, Fatih, that the fact is, employee assistance program, it is completely separate from the interpreting agency. Mm -hmm. It is an independent service. If you go and access the service, at the end, you know, the interpreting agency receives a monthly bill. They pay for it. They wouldn't know whether Fati or Miranda access the service. It's completely anonymous, yeah? So you are completely entitled to go and use the service and have your um, your privacy provide, pro protected. They wouldn't tell the interpreting agency or Fatih or Miranda existed. So mm. that's very important to know. You should feel completely unhinged. If you need it, go and use it. That's a very important message that we find that um, in the focus group, people were hesitant to use it because they don't know whether their privacy will be protected. Did, did they all know about it? No, not every one of them. Some of them don't know about, oh, what is EAP, Employee Assistance, mm. Pro Assistance Program? They don't know about it. So I think there is also a point for interpreting agencies. And I know that these days, most um, interpreting agencies do provide um, EAPs. Therefore, by all means, use it. And maybe it's a message also for employers, i.e. interpreting agencies mm -hmm. to promote it um, openly just so that their panel interpreters know where to get help if they need it. Yeah? The last point um, from these participating interpreters is that they say to us, look, um, you know, when it comes to PD activities, you get all sorts 
but when it comes to vicarious trauma, you don't see a lot. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, I suppose, um, in terms of training institutions such as our university or other, um, you know, either higher education institutions or uh, vocational uh, training programs, we all have the responsibility to teach about vicarious trauma. On the other hand, once when people get in the industry, there is a point for, you know, various training providers to provide training about vicarious trauma. That's what people say, we need more. We need to know more. Mm. We understand more just so that we know about it uh, a bit better and then that would help us to become trauma informed vicarious trauma informed which is very important well uh, like you said um, RMIT University and other tertiary institutions um, uh, you know they may have it in their programs but we also know that uh, there are many interpreters out there um, who may not have had formal training um, who may have uh, gone through or, or, or a short course these days, as we know, um, there's the skill set um, uh, and, and they may not necessarily uh, cover vicarious trauma in that as well. So in addition to uh, what the tertiary institutions provide, I guess um, uh, PD uh, events should also focus on this as well. Uh, I'm sure OZIT works on this. Um, we, we're actually working on this as well with yourself. Um, there will be a PD uh, available. We have a webinar available on vicarious trauma, um, again, delivered by yourself. Um, so, and I'm sure we'll go in a lot more detail uh, in the webinar uh, as well. Um, now, I think it's uh, quite important for the interpreters and translators to understand that this is a mental health issue then from what I'm understanding, um, you know, and, and it's okay. It's actually okay to go through these things and it's okay to ask for help. Um, you know, like you said, you were saying that uh, in some cultures, yes, if you break an arm or a leg, it's okay to go to a doctor. But, you know, if you need psychological support, it's, it's, it's a stigma. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, you've been, you know, weak um, in our research. People say that, you know, um, in my community, I can't show vulnerability. Um, I have to be strong. Be a man, be strong. That's what no. But it also affects the longevity of your career, though, doesn't it? I mean, you might not get um, uh, your, 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 you know, you know, the full return of what you give into your career if you are not 100% uh, physically and mentally fit. Mentally, precisely. That's so important. All right, so is it all doom and gloom? I mean, we do interpret in some traumatic uh, situations, but we also do interpret in some uh, positive situations as well. I mean, what happens when that happens? Mm. Um, no, it's not doom and gloom. So that's a very good um, message to spread, I suppose. Um, these days, um, vicarious trauma literature, I think it's in place for about, you know, the past 30 years and a lot more studies have come in to being, but then in probably from the recent 10 years onward, there is another um, aspect of it that people have started looking into being post-traumatic vicarious growth, if you like. So um, it means that I think for us interpreters, it's the easiest for us to imagine, say um, you, interp you interpret for the same client for a you know, um, um, longer period of time, you interpret for the same person, say in a psychotherapy um, kind of setting, and then slowly you can see this person is recovering, embracing life again, have some positive outlook of his or her life, and then at the same time, interpreting for the person, I'm sure the therapist feels positive about this person's change. And then, you know what happened? As interpreters, we also feel a sense of joy that this person has grown, has um, somehow lived the past 
may, maybe not behind, but maybe aside, but being able to, you know, have, like we say, positive outlook of life and being able to function um, more and more um, within community and then, you know, enjoy life. Now, um, this, uh, like we say, interpreters or all these help professions will or are likely to experience vicarious trauma from your client. But on the other hand, you are also likely to experience the growth your clients have vicariously. Oh, that is a very positive um, aspect of our work. I mean, you know, imagine looking at your client that they have been through, you know, many therapies therapeutic sessions and then at the end they come out from the other end being a different person embracing life that's enormously um, satisfying so um, the message is yes there is light at the end of the tunnel you might be vicariously traumatized but we may also get some vicarious growth from the joy of seeing our clients getting better um well Coming towards the end of our little chat here, do you have any tips or strategy, strategies that um, you could recommend for the practitioners out there? Uh, yes, I think if anything, my first message is really make connections with others. That's so important. Um, make connections with your colleagues, your peers, your mentors, your teachers, or you know, through professional associations. That is very, very important. In interpreting and translating can be quite lonely, right? <laughs> lonely. It is very lonely. You go out, you interpret, then you go home. If you are a translator, you just sit in front of your computer. You don't, you know, you don't have a lot of opportunities to be in contact with someone else. And that's why it is even more important that you make the effort. You have to be mindful that um, you should remain in contact with you know, all your colleagues and whoever, um, that you can kind of get a bit of debrief, talk about how you feel and what you feel. Of course, not about, you know, the case, the names and the, you know, the details of the things that you interpret, but talk about yourself, how you feel and what you want to do or, or um, um, how, it's affected you. So it is important that you have an outlet. You keep in contact with others. That's important. That's the first message. If I could put in a few more tips, if you like. Um, say, um, I think it is important these days um, for interpreters to understand that when you go for an assignment, the better you are mentally and and um, mentally prepared, the better you can perform. So to achieve that, there is absolutely nothing wrong for you to go and ask if you haven't received anything, information about the, about the, the interpreting job you are going into, yeah? So ask questions to interpreting agencies or to your client that what are you going to get yourself into? Mm -hmm. What is the case about? What is the interpreting assignment about so that you can technically prepare for it, your terminology, your contextual knowledge and all that sort of thing. I think we all know about it. But then also mentally you can prepare for it. I remember again, in this recent study we had um, an interpreter relayed her experience of going in a, it's just a, you know, in completely uh, innocent medical assignment. She went in to interpret. And then for some reason, this elderly gentleman load speaker. Um, whatever the doctor says, she faithfully interpreted into whatever the target language, but this gentleman just didn't have any responses at all, to a point that this interpreter said to the doctor, I'm sorry, am I, am I using the right language? Is my language the right one for this gentleman? Because the gentleman just didn't have any responses at all. But then the doctor at that point, only at that point said that, oh no, um, he was tortured by ISIS for three years. And therefore now, ever since then, he's, he, he stops communicating. 
Now, this interpreter became very teary by saying that, look, you know, tell me about it in advance. So it's not because technically I can't interpret it. It's perfectly all right, I can handle it. But psychologically, I have to prepare for it. This gentleman is my father's age. Look, this is the empathetic, empathic engagement, our emotional investment in the work we do. We feel for our client, but we have to go in mentally prepared because we all feel for our clients. And that's why I say it is very important that, you know, ask questions, ask about um, the assignment that you've been uh, allocated so that you go in mentally and psychologically prepared. You may very well say that, look, you know, this one, thank you very much, I'll pass, yeah? Or the other way, I suppose a lot of our uh, colleagues in the field cannot afford to say, pass this one, pass that one, and at the end, you don't have anything to interpret. Right. So it is important, much more important, or even more important that, okay, you go in with your mind completely prepared. This is you are going to be confronted with, that's important. Another tip, if I can share, is that maybe um, you have your, um, uh, your work wear, if you like. You, of course, we all know that we have to be properly addressed, properly dressed to go for your interpreting assignment. But once when you are done, when you go home, what do you do? You take off your work dress, yeah? You get into your track pants and your comfy clothes, and then essentially you kind of leave that ident identity aside. And then now you are living your personal family life. So something to demarcate your professional life and your personal life. That's also a tip that people can, can probably take up. I guess that's um, especially very important these days because of all the remote interpreting that we're doing especially those of us in victoria you know there's a lot of video interpreting a lot of telephone interpreting and um we hardly get to leave our houses so you know and it could be the fact that some interpreters if they're doing telephone interpreting especially might not be dressing up for the occasion so even just getting up and yes we're all working from home but you know Putting on some work clothes, uh, it's very important for video interpreting as well anyway. Um, but now, now we've got another reason to actually get dressed for work, even if we are working from home, because you're saying at the end of the day, when we do take our work clothes off, we're actually shedding the skin and, and getting, get, getting rid of those built up emotions um, as well and kind of leaving that on the side Precise. until we have to put it on again the next day. Exactly. You know, in the acting profession, they have this de Roman technique. Yeah. So for some actors, for them to try to, you know, fend off the, the character they play, um, they can, what they, you know what they do? They actually physically hand over their costume or their prop mm. in the movie, physically hand it over to the director and say, oh, See you later, I'll see you tomorrow. So that physical act actually is something for you to kind of, for you to mentally demarcate. Okay, that's the end of the day. I'm gonna go for my lovely family life. Unless you're a method actor, <laughs> which I guess um, we don't really recommend that for interpreters, I guess, you know, being stuck in the one character for six months, year, two years, depending on how long they're shooting for. Um, uh, look, uh, Dr. Miranda, thank you so much for giving us all that information today and giving us um, uh, those tips and strategies too. And uh, we'll look forward to further research on this. I guess um, with uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, there's a lot of remote interpreting being done. Video interpreting has skyrocketed, as we, as we all know. I wonder how vicarious trauma affects um, interpreters through remote interpreting or you know, excessive use of remote interpreting. Um, maybe, maybe we could talk about that um, in the future as well. Um, 
And uh, just uh, for you lovely listeners and viewers out there, uh, there is a webinar on vicarious trauma delivered by Dr. Miranda Lai. Um, and you will find that in the description of this episode. Uh, there will be a link there for you to access that if you like. Uh, Dr. Miranda Lai, thank you so much again for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. It's been great. Graduates Conversations Podcast.